Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast-growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now here's your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre. Hi there, and welcome to the Business Infrastructure Curing Back Office Blues Show. I'm your hostess, Alicia Butler-Pierre, and this 51st episode marks the end of Season 4. We're getting close to the one-year anniversary of the Business Infrastructure Podcast. I I can't even believe it. I'm so excited. And as a reminder, the theme for Season 4 is how I did it. And so far, we've had 12 fellow entrepreneurs come on and tell us exactly how they cured back office blues, either for themselves or for their clients. Because I close out each season with a monologue, I thought I'd come on and share with you exactly how I created my content management process. This is a process I currently use, and the reason I thought I should come on here and talk about it is because lately, for at least the past several months, a lot of times when I'm out and about networking or when I'm having one-on-one coffee meetings or lunch meetings, people are always usually complimenting me on the fact that they, they constantly see my content somewhere online. But before I get into the nitty-gritty of how I actually developed or designed my content management process, if you're listening to this episode for the first time, that means you don't know me and you probably don't know a little about my background. So I'll first take some time to tell you a little bit more about myself so that you'll have some context when I delve into the details of my process. In short, my career began in chemical engineering many years ago. I worked as a process engineer in different oil refineries as well as chemical plants. And that's really where my subject matter expertise, particularly in process design, improvement, and optimization began. It all started on that manufacturing side. Well, when I started my company, which is called Equilibria back in 2005, I realized there was a way I could actually leverage my engineering skills and apply them to solving business workflow challenges. And so the workflow challenge we're going to be talking through today is how do you actually get your content online? So many people are accessing their mobile devices to make purchases, to educate themselves, to entertain themselves. How do you join the party? So over time... I developed a proprietary methodology to help fast-growing small businesses build what I call a business infrastructure. And there was one major problem from the very beginning. No one knew what the heck business infrastructure was. And, and it's still a challenge, but that's, that's part of the reason why this podcast is in existence. So in short, it really is like a blessing and a curse, a blessing because There aren't a lot of people out there talking about business infrastructure, so I can really move into a thought leadership position, but a curse in the sense that nobody knows what it is and nobody coins it the way that I do by calling it business infrastructure. I've talked to so many people over the years who refer to it as systematizing their business or streamlining a business, or they don't even know what to call it, so therefore it's very difficult for people to find this type of information. And if, again, you're listening for the first time, let me just take a quick moment to actually tell you what business infrastructure is. It's simply a system for linking people, processes, and tools to ensure that growth happens in a profitable and sustainable way. Now, back to my story. When I started my company and I realized that, hmm, I really have a niche in this thing called business infrastructure, I started doing a lot of networking in person. And because I didn't know much about networking online at that point, again, remember this was back in 2005, the majority of my networking really did take place in person. I made it a point to join uh, industry-specific organizations. I also joined more generic type business organizations. I also joined what they call closed networking groups. And what that means is that you can join a particular organization, 
solely with the intent of organizing. These types of groups, they usually meet either once a week or sometimes twice a week, maybe even once a month. But the whole point is to be, a, once you become a, a member of that particular group, no one else can join your group who does what you do. So in essence, the idea is to create like your own sales team um, without actually paying them to be your salespeople. And, and you know, by meeting with a certain frequency, you are constantly educating people about what you do and the type of client that you're looking for or the type of customer you're looking for. Well, about two years into my business, back in 2007, was when I can recall really hearing about social media. And I remember this so well because I was invited to an event and the guest speaker was Sherry Heil. Now, you may remember Sherry from season three when I interviewed her in episode 28. <clears throat> well, at that time, Sherry was really on the forefront of this whole social media thing. And I remember her talking specifically about blogging, microblogging, vlogging, video. There were at least 30 different ways that she discussed that we could actually market our brands online. And needless to say, I was completely <laughs> overwhelmed. It was so daunting because it, it's so hard to imagine this right now. As of this recording, it's 2019, but back in 2007, this was, this was new. I, only heard, I had heard about blogging, but I didn't know what the heck microblogging was, and I certainly didn't really understand the concept of vlogging. So again, I was, I was overwhelmed. I remember thinking, where in the world do I even start? But one thing I was always very clear on from the very beginning I knew how important visuals or imagery was to my message. But what I wasn't clear on was my overarching message. In other words, if I were to put content online, it had to answer the question, what's in it for me? Not for me myself, but what's in it for actually for you, the person who's listening to this right now. So I admittedly used a spaghetti approach. I just started throwing things out there, throwing things against the wall to see what would stick, just being perfectly honest with you. And I remembered starting with my blog. I started blogging, and eventually I learned about SlideShare. And I was like, oh, well, SlideShare is great too because now I can actually upload some of my presentations. What I started to notice with SlideShare in particular was that – the number of downloads, not just views, but the number of times my content was being downloaded on SlideShare, it happened to be around process flowcharts, process maps, and I thought, well, wow, that's really intriguing. Okay, so maybe I need to post more of this type of content, at least when it comes to SlideShare. And that's also when I think I realized, okay, what may work on one platform may not necessarily work the same way on another platform. So it became very clear to me very early on that I needed a process. <laughs> of course, I have a process background, but I realized I needed a process where I could add more structure and intention to what and how I posted. And this is what Paul Nicolades and I really kind of delved into in episode 39 of season four was using processes to add more structure. Now, once I had a process for posting my blogs as well as posting content on SlideShare, it did work for a while. But then I, I had another revelation, which is what I'm sure you already know, right? But at this point about social media, it's constantly changing. And it especially changed when SlideShare was purchased by LinkedIn. And then LinkedIn went public, and they were purchased by Microsoft. <laughs> so um, it can be frustrating because once you have a process that you've developed around some of these different platforms where you may post and distribute your content, these platforms are constantly changing. It could be, honestly, it could be daily. Um, if not monthly or at least quarterly. So you have to really stay on top of it. 
And part of me staying on top of this was I realized I needed to start over. I had to press the res reset button. At this point, honestly, I still didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I was still sharing my blog and SlideShare content on LinkedIn, but I was just posting willy-nilly. And to be honest, that actually was the case for the next 10 years. And I'm just, that's just full disclosure here, guys. So again, my social media, or I should say not even just social media, but posting content online, that journey actually started back in 2007. And by 2017, I still didn't have any rhyme or reason to how I posted. Now, I should also mention that over the course of those 10 years, I had also created profiles on Twitter. I had a personal profile as well as a business profile. I created a YouTube channel, had a Facebook page, but they were all static. And as we know with social media, it's all about being social. And so my presence in all of these online platforms was actually very antisocial, looking back on it. Now, it wasn't until 2018 when I wrote my book that I felt like for the first time my messaging was crystal clear. And by the end of 2018, in December, I actually had an epiphany. I was sitting down and I realized I cannot go into 2019 trying to promote this book and again, without any rhyme or reason, just total willy-nilly, that is not going to work. I have to have a strategy. And as I was going through this period of self-reflection, it dawned on me, wait a minute, Alicia. Yeah, you have a consulting business where you've now written a book, you have a podcast, and you bring other people on. You're trying to spread this message of business infrastructure. You have a blog. You do a newsletter. You started a YouTube channel, but you don't really do much with it. When I started to take an inventory of all of the different places where I had, quote, unquote, digital real estate, I realized my company is really a media company that just happens to talk about business infrastructure and sells those kinds of products and services. The way I came to that realization, I remember when I was taking marketing classes in business school, we were always told that McDonald's is really a real estate company that just happens to sell burgers. Same as Coca-Cola is really an advertising company that just happens to sell beverages. So my company, Equilibria, is really a media company that just happens to talk about business infrastructure and provide business infrastructure-related products and services. That simple paradigm shift changed everything. And now I no longer look at content development and the distribution of that content online as a necessary evil. That's really how I thought about it. Like, oh my God, I have to take the time to write this out. I need to be out there doing business development and working with my clients. I don't have time to write this content, yet alone get on a, a platform like Twitter and post five to six times a day. I don't have the time to do it. But with my paradigm shift, I realized that this actually was a conduit for which I could share valuable information and give access to operational resources that small business owners are currently just locked out of. And I could give access to information like that to people in a way that is unique as well as engaging. So now that you have that background, it's going to hopefully provide some context to how I create my digital content management process. And it actually happens in two parts. So let's talk about the first part first. The first part is actually all about strategy. And there are nine elements that I believe you need to consider. The first is to start with your why. 
What is your story? And I know you're probably like me, like, oh, my gosh, people are saying that all the time. I'm, I'm so over it. I'm, I'm sick of hearing about the fact that we have to tell our story. But it really is true. And that is the foundation for everything that you will do as you start to communicate, whether in person or online. Take a listen to episode 46 with Hassani X because we take a very deep dive into this idea of identifying, telling, and crafting and honing your story. The second element that you need to consider when it comes to the strategic part is your audience. You have to know who you're talking to. I recommend developing avatars. And let me explain what I mean. My avatars right now are actually the characters from my book. And this might sound a little kooky, but this is what works for me. You can try something similar or or not, but just hear me out. I actually have illustrations of all of the characters from my book, and I have it printed in color in a frame that I keep on my desk. So every time I'm thinking about what am I going to communicate and how, especially when it's online, I just look to that image and I'm thinking, okay, what do each of these characters from my book who represent people like yourself, entrepreneurs, small business owners, what is it that they want to hear? Not so much what they need to hear, what do they want to hear and how can I deliver that information to them in a way that is valuable and that will resonate. The third element you want to consider is your content type. What type of content or communications will you develop and where will you distribute it? When I look at content, I always start with what I refer to as long form source material. And let me explain what I mean by that. That could be your podcast, if you do a podcast. It could be your blog, because when you write a blog post or any type of article, even if you're contributing an article to another online source, like another magazine, for example, or another very popular blog, that's what I consider to be a longer form, because you typically have a lot more freedom and flexibility in terms of the length of the content. There's also your newsletter. You may also have a book. So that's all the types of what I consider source material in a long form. Now, there are some great social media and marketing experts out there who can help you develop your strategy. And I would recommend starting with people that I've actually interviewed up to this point on the podcast. And that is Andrea D. Smith. You can find Andrea Andrea's interview, actually, if you go to season two on businessinfrastructure.tv, look for episode number 20. And I also recommend reaching out to Heather Havenwood. Heather was actually interviewed in this, this season, season four. Look for episode number 43. The reason I wanted to kind of put that quick disclaimer in there is to let you know that I'm not a marketing person. I have an appreciation for marketing strategy. I really specialize on the tactical side, the process side, the actual execution and implementation. But if you need help coming up with these elements of strategy that I'm talking through right now, definitely start with those two ladies as as a starting point. And maybe if they can't help you, they can point you in the direction of someone who can. Okay, now back to our fourth element for coming up with the strategy for your content management process. You have to determine is your business B2B or B2C, business to business or business to consumer? The reason that matters is because whatever it is that you are offering, whether you're offering truck repair services, whether you offer flower arrangements, whether you are offering some type of a coaching service, whatever it is that you offer, you have to determine where and how you will distribute your content and different platforms cater to different types of businesses. For example, what may work in an Instagram environment, which is largely B2C, may not work on LinkedIn, which is all about the B2B relationship. So really think through that. 
Now, for some of you like me, you may have a combination of products as well as services. So you can get on a multiple, or you can get on multiple platforms, but just know that the way you talk and frame your content is going to be different. Okay? Now, the fifth element is frequency. How often are you going to distribute? And when I talk about distributing content in social media speak or in online speak, that's just this, that's the equivalent really, really of, post, of posting. So when I say how often will you distribute, how often are you actually going to be posting? And again, you have to really study these different platforms to understand what would be considered a, a nuisance on one platform, which might actually be the standard on, or the norm on another platform. The sixth element for strategy that you want to think through is consistency. If you're going to do your podcast, how often will you distribute that podcast? If you say that it's going to be weekly, you better make sure you put out an episode every week. If you're, if you're saying you're going to blog daily, you better blog daily. Make sure that it's something that you can actually sustain. That is the key. Now, even if you just start off, let's say, blogging once a month, if that's all you can handle right now until you get your process refined, do that. Just make sure that you do it consistently. And then you may decide, well, you know what? Now I can at least do it twice a month. Metrics, element number seven. Engagement matters more than anything. And I know, I know, I know, I know it's so tempting to focus on getting your number of followers or subscribers or friends up on some of these different platforms. But I would encourage you to focus first on the value that you are providing. The engagement will then follow. And the more people engage with your content, the likes, the tweets, the retweets, the number of downloads, the number of subscribers, the number of followers, the number of connections, that will organically start to increase. Don't rush it. And this is actually something Heather Havenwood said, again, that was from episode 43 of this season, which I thought was just brilliant. If content is king, then engagement is queen. Make sure you go back and take a listen to that episode because she dropped uh, some, some serious gems of, of wisdom in terms of social media marketing. The eighth element, cross-referencing your content online. I would say that this, more than anything, is a gift that I have developed when it comes to my content management process. I am really good at creating my own web online. And let me explain what I mean by that. When I say cross-referencing your content, you may start with that source material. So again, let's just say if you have a blog post, where are all of the other places you can take elements or pieces of that blog post and distribute that online? And as you're distributing, you're, you're always pointing back to that original blog post. So that if people, if for example, you may give a headline, the equivalent of what a newspaper would call a headline on Twitter. And as you write that post on Twitter in the form of a headline, you're making sure that you link back to your actual blog post. And before you know it, you have created this very intricate web by interconnecting your content across multiple different platforms. And lastly, the, the ninth element that I believe you should consider for your content management strategy is to define your data attributes. Now, here's where the engineer in me is coming out. When I say data attributes, this is what I mean. The content itself, the link or the URL where your content is posted, the hashtags, the post tags, the people tagging. See, did you realize there were three different types of tags you can do? The image itself and the character count. Really quickly, I'll also just give a, a quick example here. Going back to a blog post, that's the content itself. 
when you go to a place like Twitter, there's actually a cap on the number of characters that you can actually put in a tweet. That would be an attribute that you would need to consider before you actually post something on Twitter. The worst thing in the world is to just automate a, a, to automate a tweet automatically from your blog and real only to realize that a sentence or two has been cut off because you had reached the, the character limit on Twitter. When it comes to hashtags, you know what a hashtag is. Uh, hopefully you do. If you don't, you can definitely go and <laughs> look that up online, but I'm sure everyone at this point knows what a hashtag is. But that's different from the way you actually tag your blog. When you tag your blog, that is what the search engine is actually reading. So that when people go into a search engine like YouTube or Google or Yahoo or DuckDuckGo, as they're typing out those keywords, if you have those same keywords in your contents tag, then your content should hopefully come up in that person's search. The image. Images are so important and visuals are becoming more and more important by the day. Definitely make sure you have imagery to really convey the message that is associated with whatever content it is that you're posting. Okay, so those are the nine elements for your strategy. Now to the actual process. And I'm going to attack this from a, obviously a business infrastructure standpoint. So I'm going to reference some people, some processes, and some tools. The second part is all about the tactics. How do you actually execute on your strategy once you've thought through all of those nine elements? Now, when it comes to the tactical side or developing your actual process, these are the seven elements that I believe you need to consider. And again, this is very generic, but I think it holds true for any type of industry, regardless of business. The first thing that I do is I create a template. And it's a template that I have created in Microsoft Word that I use personally. I use it every week. Every Sunday, I have this template where I'm filling out all of the information that I want to post in all of the places where I, I am online. Now, let me take a step back from that because it all starts with me figuring out what everything is going to look like for the month. And that takes me actually to the second step. I select a theme. So I look at every month, I select a theme, and by selecting a theme, it helps me keep my efforts very focused. So if my theme for a particular month is about templates, that makes it very easy for me to go and find, have I already blogged about templates? And if so, okay, now I know where my source material is. Is there a podcast that I referenced where I talked about templates? Okay, so now between the podcast episodes and the blog posts, I now have information that can feed into different tweets, Instagram posts, as well as Facebook posts. I can even take some of that information and repurpose it into an actual LinkedIn article. So those first two steps alone will go a long way in helping you put more structure and, and focus and concentrate your efforts. Select creating a, a template and selecting a theme. The third step in my process is I try to figure out how I can use existing content or create new content and repurpose it. For example, I can look at an old blog post that I may have written, let's say, seven years ago. And as I'm looking at that content, I may have an idea for a video that I can create. Well, I can then go and post that video on YouTube and then take that YouTube video and go back to that original blog post and embed the YouTube video. I can also look at the content from that blog post and figure out how I can convert that into a presentation that I can upload to SlideShare. I may even take that same old blog post 
and it, and repurpose it, kind of give it like a version 2.0 and put that as an actual article on LinkedIn. Is that making sense now? So again, you can start with that one source material and repurpose it in so many different ways. The fourth step, you now want to, now that you've figured out about your existing content or you're going to create some new content, now you want to figure out how to distribute it. So distribute the content and use your imagery according to your strategy and your data attributes. Then you can start promoting it. So when you think of things like Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, all of these different social media platforms, yes, it is a way for you to promote, but really think of it as a way of, for you to get your message to the people who need to hear it, when they want to hear it, where they want to hear it. I'm, I'm kind of chuckling to myself right now because I'm, it's a little maddening, I'll be very honest with you, because there are some people who only send me direct messages through Twitter. That is the only way they communicate with me. Then I have some potential clients who've reached out to me through YouTube. Excuse me, through YouTube. There are people who will go to my, my blog and then from the blog they get to the contact us page on the company website and they fill out a form and they contact me that way. Go where your tribe is. Go where the people who need or excuse me, not need, but want to find you and are looking for you, go where they hang out. It's not about where you think they should be. Where are they now? And reach them there. So with that example that I just shared with you, that with that blog, you can. I took that one piece of content and I just posted different variations of it in six different areas. And so that's, again, what I mean when I talk about creating this web. Fifth step, you want to test and monitor with any process. Once you've created it, you have to continuously improve it. The best way to do that is to start collecting data. And what do I mean when I say collecting data? This is what I'm looking for. I specifically look at number of comments, downloads, retweets. Views are important, but to me, the more powerful metric is how often people actually take the time to not, not just view your content, but actually download it or comment on it or actually retweet it. As you are doing this data collection, do it for at least 90 days because you want to start looking for patterns and trends. Some of the patterns or trends that you want to try to look for, just as an example, you may see, okay, well, I notice whenever I upload a podcast episode, the highest viewership rate or highest download rate is on a Wednesday. Why is that? And then you may go back and look at some of the data from some of your other platforms and you can say, well, you know what, it's because even though I promote it, on Sundays, on Wednesdays, I actually include a really swanky kind of image, and I, I promote that specifically on Instagram, and that's when I'm starting to notice podcast downloads really go up. Whatever, you, whatever patterns or trends you start to figure out, do more of that, and I think that is the, the, the beauty of social media and just whatever your online content management process is going to look like is that you have to figure out your own magical formula for engagement and just do more of what works for you. Everybody's situation is different based on your specific strategy. Step number six, automate. Once you've figured out the best time of day and post frequency, consider automating. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by automation in a few minutes. This is actually what Tim Borholt did for his sales process in episode 42. So go back and take a listen to that episode because it was really cool listening to him describe the way 
he recognized he had a very manual process and the need for them to automate it. And they actually developed their own app to help automate their sales process. So make sure you go back and check out that episode, episode number 42. Now, the last step in the actual process for your content management is to outsource. Because I'm sure now that you've listened to me talk about the strategy part, and now I'm going through the tactical part of your content management process, it is incredibly time consuming. And again, you're a small business owner. You're probably having a, you know, experiencing rapid growth right now. You don't have the time for this, especially if you're not in a marketing or sales related field. Where do you find the time? And that's something that not a lot of people I find who call themselves or tout themselves as social media experts are willing to have a, a, a candid dialogue about. It is time consuming. And if you can outsource elements of your content management process, you absolutely should. But there's a caveat, as with anything. I highly recommend you only outsource once you've first educated yourself and you have your strategy in place. That's really important. Now, in keeping with the interviews that I conducted this past season, once people would actually explain how they did something, my next question for them was, what lesson did they learn? And so if I had to answer that question, the, the one thing or the lesson that I learned as a result of designing this content management process for my company is a couple of things. One, it's ever-changing. It's constantly evolving. And I had to be comfortable in the fact that this is, of all of my company's other processes, these are the processes that are absolutely the most fluid. It definitely keeps me on my toes. And once you start going down this road, you have to maintain it. You also have to be in it for the long term. I'll share with you an example. There's a YouTube video that I posted. Again, no rhyme or reason, totally willy-nilly style. I just, on a whim, truly on a whim one day, I asked my husband if he would break out our record, uh, our camera, excuse me, and start recording me. And I think the video was a little, it, it was about an eight-minute video. And I think it may have had maybe close to 100 views within the first year of me uploading the video to YouTube. And I, honestly, I have forgotten about it. Well, it wasn't until a few months ago when I started to really get more serious about my YouTube channel, I looked at that video and it has over 8,500 views now. Wow. <laughs> How did it go from 100 to 8,500? And that's when I understood that you really do have to be in this for the long term. It takes time is another lesson that I've learned. As you've heard me describe my content management process, you may be thinking, oh, wow, you know, she's, she's really got this together. She's got this thing nailed down. But let me just be clear. It's taken me, and I'm a process professional. I, I design processes for a living, and it's taken me six months to really fine-tune it and really figure it out. The strategy part took even longer. Now, the advice that I would offer to you, if you're listening to this and you may be stuck, especially when it comes to leveraging social media, just get started. Like anything else, get started. Find your voice. Clone yourself. That's what, where processes come in. But don't attempt to do this alone. Again, you have a business. You don't have the time. Doing this the right way will take some time to think through it. And don't let anybody tell you that it doesn't take time because that is absolutely false. Again, I don't care what type of industry you're in, what, what your product or service is. It takes time to figure it out. And don't let anybody tell you that, 
that yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you can do this on your on your own. Yeah, sure. Y you can't. You can't. Now, in terms of resources, because I know I need to start wrapping this up. I've already gone way over time, so I'm I'm probably going to talk through this really quickly. But just know that I will definitely have links to everything that I'm about to reference in the show notes. In terms of people, again, you want to outsource to someone who could technically be your clone, your clone online. Now, a lot of a mistake that I find that people are, are starting to make is they think, oh, millennials. Millennials are always on their phones. They love social media. They're very good at it. They're very natural with it. So I'm just going to go find a millennial to help me post things on Facebook, just as an example. But the more important thing that you need to keep in mind is that you need to outsource it to someone, one, who is an expert in that particular platform, but then also someone who understands your business. I have, I've had people approach me who say they can help me, and then I'll, I'll, I would ask, well, can you at least read the first two chapters of my book? I'm not reading your book. I know this. Okay, well, you know what? We can't work together. How can you replicate my voice online when you really don't know what my voice even is? And the best way to figure out my voice is to look at what I've already posted and, and have written in terms of content online and to at least just read the first two chapters of my book. Now, this is actually something that Alyssa Carpenter takes a deep dive into in episode 44, this idea of working with a multi-generational workforce. So again, it's not just about a particular group of people. You really want to focus on who understands your business, but then also who understands the platform that you're using. It could very well be that you can't find that those two qualities in one person. You may have to have two different people. This is also this process of, of cloning yourself, you know, by outsourcing to someone to help you with your content management processes is really akin to a merger and acquisition. And this is what Karen Walker talks uh, very well about in episode number 47. And Next season, in season five, I'm actually going to be interviewing Marie and Contrera. And Marie is a person that her company actually helps me with my, with my content management process. And we're going to talk a lot more about this idea of how you outsource a lot of this work to someone else. One of the other things you also want to make sure is that the person that or people that you outsource your certain elements of your content management process, make sure they can show you proof of their work and its effectiveness. They also need to be able to provide you with metrics. Remember, we were talking about testing and monitoring. Again, you're not going to always have the time to go back and retrieve this data for yourself. So make sure whoever you outsource it to is, is willing and able to provide you with that type of data. Now, in terms of how you actually vet these people, Go back and take a listen to Forrest Tufts' interview as well as Dilsa Bailey's. Both of them talked about how they vet people or resources from very different perspectives, very different industries. Forrest is in the film industry, Dilsa is in the healthcare industry. But I think you would gain some really good information if you go back and take a listen to those interviews if you haven't already. Forrest is interviewed in episode number 40, and Dilsa is interviewed in episode number 49. Now, once you have found some people and they have officially become a part of your team, even if they're outsourced, make sure you edify them so that you can spark even more innovative ideas for your content management strategy and process. Now, this whole idea of edification is what Carl Reed does a phenomenal job of explaining in episode 50. And edification is actually made easier when you have an organizational design and structure that supports that edification process. And this is what Ron Carucci talked about in episode 45. Now, if you're thinking about the process itself, and it still may seem daunting to you. I know I've jam-packed a lot of information in this episode. 
go check out my book. Seriously. It's called Behind the Facade, How to Structure Company Operations for Sustainable Success. Specifically look at Chapter 8. Chapter 8 tells you step by step how to not only document your process, but how to identify the process you want to document in the first place. It also gets into different ways that you can start to improve your process as well. Now, my book is actually available online, any major online retailer. So that means it's, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, just to name a few. I'm also going to share a social media visual map that I created, I think back in 2012, and it still holds true. It's amazing. As much as social, as fluid as social media platforms are, there's still certain things that just, certain principles and concepts that, that have just remained true to the art, or not the art form, but the, the promotion form of social media. So I'm going to make sure that I have a visual of that that you can download directly from the show notes as well. In terms of tools, we've talked about people, we've talked about process, now let's wrap up with tools to help you actually automate the process. I used to read books on each of these major social media platforms, not just social media, but just books on how to blog and write e-newsletters, all those different types of content. But now I find that it's just far more effective and easier, honestly, if I could just attend a webinar or a workshop that's specific to the platform I'm trying to learn more about. So for example, I just recently finished taking a class on Instagram. There was so much I didn't know about Instagram, and now I feel so much more equipped and empowered to be able to strengthen my strategy when it comes to posting content on Instagram in particular. Once you're ready to outsource, you also want to make sure you add an extra layer of protection to your accounts. I know this is probably, if not the first most important reason people don't outsource is definitely a close second. And that is, oh my gosh, what if they post something I don't agree with? What if they change something, a password or something like that, and then I'm locked out of my account? Here's what you do. You want to make sure you activate two-factor authentication on all of your online accounts. Even with my blog, even with my website in general, whenever someone else is doing some work on my blog, on my newsletter, which is through MailChimp, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, I have activated that two-factor authentication. And what that means is that I actually receive a text message anytime, my, including myself, anytime my, any of those accounts is accessed, I receive a text message with a code that only can come to me on my phone or to directly to me through my email address. And then I share that code. In other words, it's keeping me aware of when people are accessing the account. Okay? Um, there's also another, there, there's a plethora of apps that are out there to help, help you actually streamline, time out your posts on different social media efforts, I'm just going to go through these really quickly, but again, just know that you can go to the show notes to get more detail. Uh, some of those tools are Acuity. There's GoCanvas.com, Adobe Stock, DiversityPhotos.com, Canva, Bitly, TinyURL. Again, this is just a snapshot of all of the tons of automation tools that are out there for your online content management process. Also, make sure you check out a list of resources that Jason Kavnes shared in episode 48. It's actually a form that you can download, and I think it was, oh gosh, it was well over 20 different apps, um, and Linktree and SmarterQ are just two that come to mind off the top of my head. Another person who was also very kind and generous to share some of the automation tools that she uses is Wynn Kelly Charles. And Wynn was actually sharing some of the dictation and transcription tools that she uses as a part of her book writing process. Books are content, right? So even if you aren't writing a book 
if you're just writing a blog post, these tools that she referenced may also be of use to you. So go back and check out episode 41 so you can listen and get access to the information that she shared. I've also created a video where I actually demonstrate what my content calendar actually looks like and how I created it. And you'll be able to see that video also in the show notes. If you have any questions, I know I've gone through a lot and I apologize this, this monologue is so long, but I felt this was information that you really should hear. If you have any questions about anything that I've said, or if you'd like to work with me in creating your cu customized content management process, there are multiple ways you can get in touch with me. One way is to follow me on, on social media. That's, you know, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. You can find me. Just look for Alicia Butler-Pierre. That's A-L-I-C-I-A. B like boy, U, T like Tom, L-E-R. And then last name, Pierre. P like Paul, I-E-R-R-E. -E. The other way to get a hold of me is to go to businessinfrastructure.tv and click on the contact form. You'll be routed to a form that you can fill out, and from there we can set up a date and time to talk. Again, I'm going to have links to all of the information that I shared in this episode, including the example process map and the video for creating a content calendar in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. Now, while you're at the site, click on the Listen tab to find this episode. It's episode number 51. And as a quick recap, we talked about developing a strategy, documenting a process, considering the strategy elements and data attributes, automating that process, testing and improving the process, and ultimately outsourcing certain pieces of your process. You will know that you have a great process and that it's working when people start coming up to you and saying, oh my gosh, I see your stuff everywhere. How do you find the time? And your response is going to be, well, I have a process. Trust me, it's a great feeling. I know this was a longer monologue again, but I hope you found it useful. Go back and listen to this again, take notes, and while you're at it, don't forget to download all 13 of season four's episodes and share this with people in your network that you think could also benefit from this information. We're getting better and better like fine wine. We're getting better with time. <laughs> so season five is going to be no different, and I am so excited because each guest is going to come on the show and tell us the one thing we need to know about a particular pop topic as it relates to curing different back office blues. A lot of them are actually going to talk about communications or some, some aspect of communications. So you'll definitely want to tune in for that. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this episode throughout the entire um, duration of the episode. I really appreciate it. You have no idea. This is this has been uh, very eye-opening for me doing this podcast, and I am just so excited to continue to share even more resources and special guests with you. It's my pleasure. Now, it's your turn. Get out there. Start getting your content management process defined, documented, outsourced, so that you can keep growing a sustainable business. But make sure you stay focused, stay encouraged, because this entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. Thank you for listening to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues with Alicia Butler-Pierre. If you like what you've heard, do us a favor and subscribe, leave a rating and review, and more importantly, share with your colleagues and team members who could benefit from the information. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.